Good afternoon from Yummy Bee TV. Wishing you all well, sending plenty of love to you all as usual and as promised over the last few days. Um, I told you all on live themes and many, many weeks ago now um, that Kirsty Moore would be coming to Yummy Bee TV to speak exclusively and saying a few things that have never been heard before on other platforms or media, if you like, but these are the absolute facts. And in her own words, um, her story, her brother's sad story, Jason Moore, who is Kirsty Moore's brother, serving a life sentence for a murder that he did not commit, that everybody out here, every single person that you talk to about this case, totally agree that there was nothing there. We're gonna let Kirsty explain it to you mostly today. Um, we're going to start now. It's a miscarriage of justice, yeah? A miscarriage of justice that seems to be happening quite a lot or has happened quite a lot in the past and we wonder sometimes why it takes so long for, you know, um, these miscarriages to reach the appeal court when quite early on during these cases we find that there's new evidence or things that highlight the case that he would have got convicted of. They would have heard this bit. The only significant thing in Jason's case is that there are so many bits. But in the house with me, as I said, is... Kirsty Moore. Hi, Yami. I love you, Kirsty. Thanks for coming on, my you. darling. The particulars of the, um, the offence, right, we're going to go through first. 2005, August, a rain-soaked day, cold day. Jason Moore was in a car with who that morning? My younger sister. Who is? Rhonda Moore. Rhonda Moore. So can you remind us about that? morning in particular what your sister said and yeah so on the morning um jason was going to a sports center and uh, he didn't drive so he asked because we're down here in canary wharf yeah and uh, he asked Rhonda to drive him to gant hill yeah. which is in ilford yeah um and he was gonna meet his co-defendant okay go and play racquetball or go to the gym at the sports center which was embarking side right and then uh, Rhonda was going to go do some grocery shopping and then she was going to wait for Jason and then come back right so what in actual fact um, happened was she dropped him off and halfway between each way he jumped into a vehicle with his um, alleged co-defendant yeah that was going to be his co-defendant in a murder trial that yes. which no one really uh, anticipated that happening on a chance meeting like that. Um, he jumped into his co-defendant's car at what stage? At, well, at Gantt's Hill, at but Gantt's it was Hill. it was like 10, 20 in the morning, it was around that time. Right. Yeah. Go on, first. So, and they did just that. Rhonda took him to Gantt's Hill um, and Jason's co-defendant actually lived in Gantt's Hill at the time, so that made sense. Yeah. He didn't have to come all the way back down here yeah. and then go all the way back to go to Redbridge mm. Sports Centre. Mm. So Rhonda dropped Jason off. He met his co-defendant, got in the car, and they headed towards um, Barkingside Gym. Uh, gym. Yeah. And uh, Rhonda went to Sainsbury's. What took place then? Why didn't they end up going straight to the gym then? So they didn't go to the gym because on the way to the gym, uh, the co-defendant got a phone call. Yeah. And that phone call instigated the code D turning the car around back in the other direction towards Gantt's Hill Roundabout. What kind of phone conversation um, did Jason say was taking place? It was a heated, a heated conversation from a girl Oh, on the phone okay. and basically spun the car around and there's a, a nightclub there called faces and there's a phone box outside yeah and uh, he jumped out the car went to that phone box called robert darby got back into the car drove across the roundabout well, hold on hold on hold on sorry Kirsten. yeah robert darby is meant to be is a is the victim yes of the murder. that's correct who phoned who who who, who? the co-defendant spoke to darby on the phone while yes. he was in the car with jason no, no. He got out of oh, the car okay. when he when he turned the car around. Round. He got out of the car at a phone box. Okay. Went to the phone box, called Robert Darby. Yeah. Got back in the car, drove across the roundabout, and ended up in Perth Road. Um, so he called Robert Darby. Jason's unaware of what's happening. Yes, totally unaware. That, totally unaware. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, Robert. Darby, so they 
basically he goes to a phone box so what he hasn't phoned him on his own cell phone he's co-defendant he uses a phone box to do it and Robert Darby is not too far away and they go and meet up outside yeah and the reason he's not too far away is because the phone call which was at 11 47 so that yeah. phone call came at 11 47 and it happened to be the co-defendant's girlfriend who owned a bar on Gantz Hill Roundabout. And she called yeah. and was uh, screaming down the phone for the co-defendant to call Robert Darby. Which is why spun round. And sought this out because Robert Darby was actually at her bar at the back door threatening and all sorts, creating drama to whoever was in the bar. Right. And we found out later, it was the girlfriend's sister that was opening up the bar that day. So the co-defendant's girlfriend's sister. sister. Yes. She gets alarmed. She says, somebody's completely off their face there and is threatening blue murder. Yes. And he's calling out the co-defendant's name. Where is he? Where is he? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and a bit more than that. It was very threatening behavior at the back door so that would be explained why the co-defendant yeah. spun the car around got into the phone box yeah called it on because they were close by together and then what happened then? yeah so, so that jason was, is still a passenger yeah what did jay surely did jason well, jason being... was like calm, calm down what you're going on about calm down right but this was all happening at you know speed right. spinning cars around losing your temper jumping out in a on oh, a phone God. box making oh. a call and getting that car over that roundabout so we end up in the, the fatal um, destination. Yeah, Perth Road, outside a pub called the Valentine Pub. The Valentine Pub. Yeah. So the car pulls to a halt. Yeah. Gets out the code event. Well, Robert Darby was driving a black BMW. He was already there. He was already there. Yeah. And the, and in, the bar that I was just talking about yeah. is literally adjacent. Right. So... He was already in the road, He's in Perth fire. Road, oh. yeah. And then obviously the co-defendants driven their, that car yeah. into the road and CCTV clocks it at seven minutes. There was seven minutes between the two cars arriving in that road. Yeah, because, okay. So the general consensus is allegedly that Robert Darby and the co-defendant, um, the drama and the, you know, the threats, the violence, certain part pieces of life though they say on the street that they were well-known hardened criminals and i don't know i've never heard of either now i i hear that it was a three thousand pound debt that darby was calling on from the co-defendant and that's why it was the way it was yeah verbally that's, yeah that's right but jason didn't know any of that of course he doesn't yeah. so then in reality um um the co-defendant it um darby is his blood's boiling He's threatened, so the co-defendant really is protecting his girlfriend's sister. He's phoning up women and doing all kind of stuff. So in his right mind, he thinks, well, I've got to go and confront you, mate. You're, it's, you, you ain't said nothing to me. I, well, you have on the phone verbally. You've been going on some weeks prior. Oh. And he feels the need, well, listen, you're, you're overstepping the mark now. And he goes well, down there to have a chat with him. Yeah, he had been in the bar the night before as well. Who? Um, Robert Darby. Right. If we go back to the days before the incident, yeah. He was actively looking for the co-defendant, actively looking. Wow. He was going in the bar, you know, and uh, he was looking for his money. <laughs> but we didn't know that at the time. Time, no. No, Jason. Weren't privy to any of this information. No, no, no. You know, Jason's not from that area. No. He's down here. All right, but, but, you know? but just to say, Kirst, because we've got to keep it fair on the yeah. TV. what kind of, how close were the co-defendant and Jason Moore? Um, well, they knew each other yeah. and they had known each other over years, but it was an acquaintance walk in a bar, give a nod. Yeah. Um, maybe they met, uh, I think they did actually meet at the Barkingside gym. gym. So when yeah, you're meeting people, familiar faces and all that, and uh, I think, you know, uh, uh. That's, you know, they would have a chat here and there. I'm not, you mm. know. So therefore, it's fair to say that the co-defendant in his mind, he really, until he got the phone call, was just on a, a pleasant day to go to the gym with Jason yeah. in his own mind as well. That's right. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Fair to say that? It's fair okay. to say that, yeah. So then um, the car stops. Darby's there. Is there anyone else with Darby that morning? He had a friend in the car with him. Mm. And his name's Paul Hunt. And this is in the transcripts? Yes. 
So this and he'd been with him for like 24 hours oh. at this point. They'd spent the day together the day, but well, he came to his house late. Well, I think it was midday, one o'clock. He'd come to his house the night before. He knew the state that he was in. He'd had Robert Darby, he'd had dinner at his house. They'd had friends over. They'd been drinking and all the rest of it. And there's a, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a trail of them being together all the way through to the next morning. Yeah. Um, and also, and also, um, if you look at the timeline of them spending that time together, yeah. uh, Paul Hunt would have been at the bar the night before with Robert Darby. Robert Darby came all the way back to Canary Wharf because Robert Darby lived on the Isle of Dogs. Yeah. So they would have had to have driven past Jason's house. Yeah. So the fact that they did that mm -hmm. and didn't stop to look for Jason tells you everything you need to know there. Because I hear that Jason Moore and Robert Darby live across the road from each other. Well, yeah, not across the road, well, but in the same area. It's about yeah. 200 yards yeah. over the bridge. Yeah, it's over the bridge. The so if you had a problem yes. with Jason Moore, he only has to knock on the door. Oh, yeah. He, and vice I mean, versa. Yeah, the route would have taken him past Jason's house. All right, all right. Let's get down to the let's yeah. get down to the critical stage. By the way, um, this geezer that you mentioned that was, I think, a witness at the trial or whatever. He was a witness because he was with Paul Darby. Hunt, yeah. Right. So you say, right? I don't know. Him. Yeah. Um, um, what was I going to say? So, oh shit, Emmy, what was you going to say? So, did he know the co-defendant? Yes. Oh, he did. Yes, but we didn't know that. Oh, he's in the right angle then. Yeah. Turns out that the co-defendant, Robert Darby. Yeah. And Paul Hunt had all known each other for years. Oh, God. And it's more than that. The girlfriends had known each other for years. And Robert Darby's girlfriend actually worked in um, Martin, the co defendant's girlfriend's bar. She was an employee of hers for years. Right, critically, yeah. Kirsty, I've got to ask you. Mm -hmm. It's a very sad moment for the Darby family as well. Of course, when we go over yeah. stuff where you um, lose loved ones, I know that. Um, the pathologist in the report suggests that um, Robert Darby had a lot of drugs in his system and he had a bit of mental health, believing. I'm hearing that he was involved well, it, in the tsunami and was yeah, that's right. Yeah. So he's never quite, he must have had some PTSD and something. So we mustn't yeah. overlook the fact that he's a human being. He yeah, lost his life. Is, no matter yeah. what his state of mind is, he, he was yeah. very erratic. We've got his own brother, mm. I believe, has said this on other places. So I've been told. Yeah. Um, but we always believe that uh, prevention is better than cure. But at the same time, um, getting out of the car, the co-defendant, Jason Moore stays in the car. Yes. So he gets out, Darby's already there with that geezer you're talking about. Yes. And he walks over, what happens? Well, it, there was like, obviously, as you can imagine, there would be, they both got out of the car, it was high, you know, Energy. shouting and all the rest of it. Yep. And um, they came together, clashed. Yeah. And that's when the uh, stabbing occurred. How did that, who swung first and, you know, what was it, a fisted car? Well, Robert Darby got out of the car with a knife. And what kind of knife? It was a Stanley knife, a yellow Stanley knife. A Stanley knife like you get in the workshops in yeah, prisoners? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Not the biggest tool in the no. world. No. Not being funny, any tool can be dangerous. Okay, so they walk up to each other. The co-defendant is not having a bar of it. He's looking... Well, know, Robert, Robert Darby... Uh, According to the co-defendant oh. from trial transcripts, Robert Darby got out of the car oh. and um, was screaming at him. Oh, what the is are you doing with that in the car? Yeah, referring to Jason. Jason. Yeah, like, thinking, what the hell are you doing with that? He thinks he brought him. To, yeah, but well, really, didn't in reality, expect didn't, to see him there. Well, that shows that, that didn't wasn't, expect to Jason see him didn't there. expect to be there. Either. Exactly. Oh, was exactly. this in a trial? Sorry, that was said. That was said in the trial. Yes. Oh, it's in the transcript. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, what happened? The incident unfolds. He pulls out the standing knife. There's a right heated um, argument, extremely high yeah. temperature, energy. Yeah. It's going off. What? Yeah. What's the? How did it? Well, the it witness, was. It who's, was... Who's there? Hold on. So the man you're talking about is with Darby. Um, this this great other witness called Abdul Ahmed. Do you want to hear about him? Trust me. Oh. So he's meant to be there at that time as well. Yeah. Is there anyone but else nobody's... in the vicinity at that time when this kicks off? Right, so Abdul Ahmed, nobody saw him. Right. We'll come to that in a bit. Right, go on. Um, Sally Palmer, she was driving her car down Perth Road. Perth Road's a one-way street. Party. Don't Innocent know no party. One. She was a nurse. She okay. was driving her little car down the right. road. Right, right. Yeah. And Jason never got out Jason of the car? Jason didn't get out of the car until after the clash. After the clash. Yeah, because he got out of the car because he thought yeah. that um, 
the co-defendant was hurt. Right. Right, right. So it kicks off. Who strikes first? Um, Darby. Well, no, you to be, I don't know. No I, I, I don't actually know, do you know? I well, don't the witness know. told, well, I don't know, I've given 10 Well, the, wit the witnesses well, said ooh, that, ooh. Um, so, well, the co-defendant says that uh, his defence was um, that Darby got out of the car and hit him with the butt end of a Stanley knife unconscious. So we not know that, that that's not feasible. Right. Abdul Ahmed says that the passenger of the silver car got out and stabbed Darby. While the co defendant's on the floor? Yes. But then, if he said he got out of the passenger seat and the co defendant says he's knocked out unconscious, that only leaves um, Darby and that geezer you spoke about, somebody named Paul, and Abdul Ahmed <laughs> watching. Well, then, how did he take the knife? It must have been a struggle. Did he take the standing knife off? Um, Darby and kill him. How, how would that be? Because then if the code defense is on the floor, Jason would have to be going over there to have a fight with him to get the knife out of his hand to kill him if that's the weapon that's been used. Is it the weapon that's been used in the murder, the Stanley knife? Well, in the trial, they said that it wasn't possible, but it, it, it's come to light that it was actually possible that he could have fallen on his own knife. Was that question ever asked at trial? It was discussed at trial, but there was also there was another issue around all that at the trial, all the pathology, the medical evidence, and all the scientific. But what I'm saying is, if yeah. the great, supposedly Abdul Ahmed, who's really probably the most unreliable witness we'll get around to in a minute in history of the criminal justice law thing, how can he say that Jason got out of the car and stabbed Darby? How does Jason fall into the picture? If he says that he did it, what weapon did he use? How did he get to take it off Darby? Well, he, Unless Jason came out with another weapon well, and backed him because his, his mate was unconscious on the floor. How does it all work out? And what was Hunt doing at the same time? Exactly. Well, what was going on? Why didn't he stop? What was going on? We, you know, he knew my men on the floor. Why not break out? Right, if he's unconscious. What, what, so many little discrepancies early on in the incident that are apparent. Well, he wasn't unconscious, was he, Yami? Well, I don't know, but it doesn't no, sound like it. Doesn't sound like it, does it? Um, so, you know, you've got Abdul Ahmed saying the passenger of the silver car was the man that stabbed Robert Darby. Mm. You've got. Um, How did he describe the passenger, Jason Moore? Five Abdul foot, Ahmed. Abdul Ahmed said that the stabber was five foot ten. Why? Right. What did Sally Palmer say? She said that the stabber was five foot ten. What colour jacket did she say Jason was wearing? They both said blue jacket. The other thing to clarify, I'm hearing through the grapevine that there was a 999 call from the victim Robert Darby's girlfriend to the police that morning saying, listen, Robert Darby is threatening, he's in serious trouble, he said he's going to do this and do that, you've got to do something about it. Is this any, any factual stuff in that, that trial, anything mentioned like that? Yeah, there was a 999 call that was played and it was Robert Darby's girlfriend in the morning, talking about early morning, so about seven, eight o'clock. So everybody was driving. She was driving down the road. All right. of a sudden, Robert Darby was in his car, and he was like hitting her car, if you like, bump, like bumping her car. Cool. And there was an opportunity when he was out the car, and he was um, trying to smash in her window. Oh, oh. And while he's doing all that, she's on the phone to nine nine nine. His state of mind. And she said that his state of mind that day was uh, like a man possessed. All right, that's sad, sad. Yeah. Sad. So, so then. <laughs> Five foot seven, five foot ten. What jacket? Again, sorry. For right, so right five. There. So the the two witnesses said that there was three men in the street. Three men in the street. One was five foot seven. Does Sally Palmer say the same thing as Abdul Ahmed that the passenger of the car that was five foot ten? So Abdul Ahmed says she says he's five foot seven. Did she say about anything different to what Abdul Ahmed says yes. about the jacket? No. Well, she so if if we just go back to what they do say what and then we'll go back, back to, to what they the don't agree yeah, on right. right they both agree that the stabber was wearing a blue jacket right they both agree that the stabber's five foot ten but i thought sally said he was five foot seven no five right. foot ten so that's five foot ten yeah they both agree that the stabber wore a blue jacket right did jason Moore have both, a blue jacket on that morning they both agree that the third man in the street is five foot seven okay that's... they both agree that the victim is six foot Gotcha. They both agree that the stabber has a number two haircut. Go right. Ahead, what they don't agree on is the cars in the road. Which brings me to so the we pictures, got, please. 
Robert Darby and Paul Hunt in a black BMW. We've got um, Jason and the co-defendant in a silver convertible BMW black roof. But it's silver, but with a black roof. We'll show you a picture in a sec. Gotcha. So Abdul Ahmed. So these two cars arrive seven minutes apart. That's very important. Okay. Abdul Ahmed says that the two cars pulled up bumper to bumper, like something out of the movies where yeah. it's screeched to together, right? Mm -hmm. Sally Palmer is driving down that road and she says 100% there was only one car in the road, one black BMW. That was already there. And she had to manoeuvre around it. So she gives this really detailed description about coming into that road and maneuvering around the black BMW. And she actually pulled up on the left and called 999. She was the first person to call 999. Because she could see a victim of the floor. Yeah. So right. if we have a look yeah, so give me those. at the car that Jason's Thank you. in. Give me that, please. And pass me those other description yeah, pictures, please. Thing. This is why it's very important because that doesn't look like a number two haircut to me. Yeah. Um, and also pass me that little piece there. And Jeff, really nice to see you. Um, there's um, Jason, funny enough, Jason Moore's best face today. Say, come Jeff, have a quick say hello. Hello, how are we doing? All right, Jeff. All good. Loads Lovely. of love, my boy. Yeah. Strange, that. Didn't know he was there. Right, now listen carefully. This is really fine to me. Now, the great, you know I'm saying it tongue in cheek here about the wit uh, supposed witness, Abdul Ahmed, we kind of don't mind Sally Palmer. The truth be known. So look, this is this is the car that Jason Moore and his co-defendant um, arrived arrived in. Right? See it? Great big black roof. Got it, there. right? This is what the great Abdul Ahmed again says they arrived in. Right? It's so already he's one nil down. One nil down, Abdul Ahmed before um in the first line of the first line of the statement right so watch this we get round to the description of course um ICIs male um five foot ten um number two haircut number two haircut number yeah. two haircut Jason's six foot five hold on can I say that bit please of course all right wait <laughs> now Jason is six foot five right it's not just six foot five he's built like a tank he's no. 18 stone, He's six eight foot five. Stone, yeah. 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 Now look, Jason Moore definitely didn't have a number two haircut, right? So that's him. But the great Abdul Ahmed, again in his first statement, says that definitely the stabber looked like this. He didn't just say he looked like this. He picked that man out as the stabber. He picked that man out as the stabber. Mm. He just right? happened to be a volunteer. And just for safekeeping, in case I forget afterwards that. Oh no, I won't forget that bit. We'll get back. But all right, okay. So the victim, um, Robert Darby, sadly, is lying on the floor. Um, the geezer that you talk about that was with Robert Darby. Yeah, right. Paul Hunt. Right. At the trial, he comes because he's a witness. He knows both parties. What does he do at this stage then? Because he's not meant to be two of his um, besties having a rail. What happens and where, what was what was his account of what happened then? Because he turned up with Darby, so you say, and but they say it's in the transcripts. What 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 happened after that? What did he do? Well, his account was that um, Robert Darby got out of the car and got into the pub, and the next thing he saw was um, like if they're on the road, if yeah. he's on the road, the, the the pub had like a little car park around okay. the side, outside the front entrance. Yeah. His account to the police on the day was yeah. that Robert Darby had got out of the car, gone into the pub and said he'd be right back. Okay. He didn't come back okay. and then he saw him over there in the car park, park, collapsed on the floor. So he drove the car, the black BMW, out of the road into the pub car park. He went to him, said that he went over to him. Yeah, now this is very important. He went over to him yeah. and he said that he flipped him over and there was a yellow Stanley knife in his hand. And because he was concerned for his safety, he went and hit, hid it. You know those A-boards? Yeah. He went and hid it under an A-board. Then he came back to Robert Darby and he tried to drag him in the car. But hold on. The whole time he's doing it, he's moved the, moved the crime scene out of the road. So when the police turned up, they, they thought the crime scene was in the car park. 
Yeah. So that went against Jason, loss of Vern Dix and all the rest of it. Then um, he's now being treated as a witness. But two barmen come out the pub and while they're trying to call 999, nine, nine, nine. she's over there calling 999. Nine, nine. The one thing his mate didn't do was call 999. Nine, nine. Instead, he called his girlfriend. And the two barmen said that when he was on the phone to his girlfriend, he was going, he's done him, he's done him. And the oh. one chap said, I got the impression he knew who had done him. It's in his statement. Okay. Anyway, one, once he was trying to get him in the car, I realised he couldn't do it, so he couldn't leave the scene. He was trying to get away from the scene, you know what I mean? The only thing I can understand... So then the police turn up, he gets treated as a witness, he gets put in the car with the two, the two other witnesses, they all get transported to Ilford Police Station, yeah. and it was when they got him at Ilford Police Station, an officer rung through to the officer that was waiting with him and said, well, he's just been seen at the pub on CCTV hiding the knife. In his statement on the day, he never says he was asleep. Yeah? Never says I it. I was going to say, the guy in the no. transcript that said, yeah. he, said he was when asleep he gets he to the, When he gets into the trial, and by the way, he didn't want to come, the, the, he was summoned to come, they went and got him, and he turned up in a wheelchair. When that happened, he got on oath, he sat there and told the jury that he was asleep and didn't see nothing. I didn't say that in the original statement. No. So hold on, let me clarify this. The man you're talking about, who was summoned to go to court, um, yeah. I'm not saying his name, but the one that says he was asleep, yeah. the one that said in the early bit he did go over to his friend because he was worried he had to take the standing knife. Yeah. Oh, it sounds a bit snaky. Oh, well, I'm not leaving. But is this the man that you're talking about hiding the knife there? Yeah. Is that the vicinity where the murder happened? No. Ladies and gentlemen, that is... There, sadly, um, the victim lying there, and the car there, and he, the one that was sleeping, is seen hiding the knife there. But that bit, obviously, was shown at trial, yes? Yeah. That was shown at trial? Um, Him hiding the knife? Oh, no, I don't know, Yummy. I don't think so. You don't know? No, I don't think it was. But if he said he was asleep, Because we had be this whole issue with a jury bundle. Oh, okay. So, you know. So he turns up to court. In a witness, because yeah. we're going to get round to the case here. Oh, yes, worth remembering. Also. If you have a look at the yeah. picture, you'll, you'll see the 11.59 okay. that happened. 11.59, so they say 11.57. So this is... Well, it's very important because, oh, because the, the, co-defendant is, rings, two... the co-defendant rings his girlfriend at 12.03. Oh, dear. And they were just having a chat about how much they love each other. A day, it's just a walk in the park. And what happened was she wouldn't tell the police about that phone call. But when the co-defendant got into the trial, he yeah. said, oh, no, I would have told her what had happened. But hold on. Yeah. When he got summoned to court. No, I'm talking about the co-defendant's co girlfriend. Yeah, the, co oh, the co-defendant's girlfriend what? Sorry, yeah. Person. So this was. He a, got the co-defendant, yeah. you're saying, he spoke to his girlfriend. girlfriend at 12.03. He was asked this. At court? Yes. On a trial? Yes. He says, well, there's a phone call the with you and your missus yes. at such and such a time. Oh, no, I would have what told... She... He said, I would have told her what happened. I would have told her what happened. And what did he say on oath? About this. No, he, he said that in the trial, but she, oh. when the police went round to question her, yeah. she she claimed he never, he didn't say anything. It was just a, do you want to go for a coffee kind of chat? At three minutes past four. Just after, just after the victim yeah. was yeah. passed away. Yeah. So, at the trial, the man in the picture who's hiding the knife, the crime scene that the police have sealed off is the actual, not the scene where the. That's correct. Mm. Oh dear, oh dear. So he turns up in court in a wheelchair. I've done that one before, by the way. Didn't turn up. He was brought to court. He was brought to court, but suffering from mental health, turning up in a wheelchair. No mental health. Well, that's what they said. No. No mental health. Right, he he claims he had he claims he had a back problem. He had a back problem. Mm. So he turns up a little bit worse aware. I'm not that well. Yeah. Um, I've and then he was seen at the market three days later Christmas shopping. I pulled that move once. Did you? Yeah. Did it work? No, I've got family with you. <laughs> but that's me, of course. Uh, but Percy, no, seriously, that um Yes, yeah, it's, it's a difficult uh, no. there's so, the so much going on. Right, yeah, no, no, no. You've yeah. done really well here. So we get yeah. the viewers in the full but picture. What we need he to did the other bit. Sorry, Kirsty, I had to clarify that we needed. Did Robert Darby, you know, I mean, I don't like to say, but I threw the grapevine. Was he was alleged to have a few knives around him and was showing people, I've got all these machetes he had him in the car. And yeah. was he threatening his girlfriend at that well, time as well? It's, it's fair to say that what we do know is that Robert Darby 
had been out for four days. It had been his birthday. Yeah, and to, to me, my opinion would be he was looking, mm -hmm. he was looking for that money and had been, he had been for days. And when you're, and then what he'd done, he's he'd he'd got to Paul Hunt's house, he'd stayed there the night before, and that is in Chadwell Heath, that place. So it's not far from mm -hmm. Gant Hill. Mm -hmm. He'd stayed with him. They'd been drinking, partying, but he'd he'd, he'd been on what they call a bender. So he was highly charged, and yes, he was on a mission to find Martin Power. Because and we know it, because people are saying it. Yeah. But also, he was he did have uh, knives in the boot of the car. Oh, God. It, you know, but so the we, one thing for me, sorry, Anne, no, the one on, thing on. for me is that Paul Hunt must have known what happened on the other side of that phone call. That 1147 phone call where the co-defendant swung the car around. And the reason for that is he was sitting next to him. He'd been in the bar with him the night before. So he was with Darby He'd been in the back car to Darby's he house. With him when he, was... he was partying But doesn't he say him. that in his statement? Sorry? What is, um, he doesn't say any of that in his statement. No. But he's obviously with him. Yes, he's with him the whole time. Because so, he's in the car. They just had exactly. a conversation. So he would so know. So the time frame this... would have to say, unless he's flew, flown from a plane or a rocket. Well, he's the one jumping... person that could throw light oh, on dear. what the hell Robert Darby was saying. Gordon Bennett. Yeah? Right. And he is the one person that knew Martin Powers' mo. Uh, sorry. The one person that knew the co defendant's motive. Yeah. Or the Robert Darby's motive, you know? Yeah, because. Mr. Murphy, his co-defendant got not guilty, but um, um, well, I think we should... yeah, but hold on. He's the, case he's the one person. Mm. Paul Hunt is so the one person. Paul, he's gone the other way. Mixed between two people, he's gone the other way. Bottled it. Whatever you know. If it was me back in the day, I. If you're deciding, but it's the only difference is you're turning up with a man who's got all these weapons. You're there, but you're meant to be friendly. with Surely you would have been able to talk him up. Because when you're high like that and you're after debts, you're thinking, I've got to get my money because I've smoked the profit. I've got other things going on. You better get my money because I'm running now. You make sure you've whatever the deal is. We don't actually know. The one thing that's definite is that Jason Moore is in the box. With Abdul Ahmed, right, let's get this right. In 2005, August, this crime happened. Hold on a minute. The trial didn't start to 2012, so I've got to ask you this today. Sorry, Yam, can I just go back and just... Go on then. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to make it crystal clear about Paul Hunt. Yeah. I just want to make it for my own benefit, yeah? Mm. Paul Hunt had been in Robert Darby's company now. At, at, at the scene of the crime, he had now been in Robert Darby's company for over 24 hours. He was drinking with him. Okay. He was taking drugs with him. Mm. He would have known, and he would have known what Robert was trying to achieve with regards to the co-defendant. He would have known about the money. He would have been with Darby when they went to the bar the night before. He was with Darby when he came back to his home address, drove past Jason's car, picked up whatever it is they were. He was with him when they went back to Gantz Hill. He was with him on the morning. He was with him on Definitely. the 11.47 phone call. He was with him at the back door of the bar. <laughs> he was the last person to speak to Robert Darby, but he would have heard everything on the other side of these conversations. But yet, yet he, turns he into told the, forensic the police scientist, the man nothing. in the picture, he turns into a forensic scientist, the man that he came with, decides to hide the knife on behalf of what? Anyway, it's nothing to do with me. Because he knows, got... because they all knew each other. But who would he have been more closer to, would you believe, on the word on the street? I don't know. I don't really know. doesn't matter. Poor old Robert Darby's yeah. lost his life and his state of mind wasn't good. That doesn't excuse anything as far as I'm concerned. But like I said so... before, they were all from that area. Okay. Okay. So, okay. You know? But, um, so the trial. Now, Abdul Ahmed, right, so what I was about to ask you, that happened in 2005. Why am I reading a trial that started in 2012? Well, yeah, because what they, um, Jason didn't come in for questioning for all those years. Right. And the reason for that was because of the Derby family initially, but then what the police added to that. So initially, Jason was fed information by the co-defendant that the Derby family was a... Um, a hardened... A, high, a, a violent 
East End family. Yeah. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, and that Darby would come looking for Jason and he knew where Jason lived. They, they lived across the road from each other. And, well, sort of. So Jason didn't know what to do, right? So, and he's still with my sister. <laughs> he's with my sister now. Right. Yeah, he's with my sister. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't come back. They were fed this information by the Cody that this highly violent East End family from the Isle of Dogs. Robert Darby had older brothers. They were violent. The whole family had this reputation. The police went to see my parents. My dad said to the police, if Jason comes in for questioning and answers your questions, the police even told my parents that they just knew that Jason was a witness. They knew it was between the co-defendant and Darby. So my dad said, would you be able to, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Yummy? Prote like, protect Mike if he protect comes Jason in. if he comes in, if you like. And they said, no. Oh, and no. while we're at it, we can't protect you either. And oh, the no. consequence of that was that my parents sold up and, my, and went to a different country. Yeah. My sister, she went to America and she's never come back since. So there was these serious, serious um, issues surrounding this. And so that is why we all stayed there. away. We let there. Yes. So I was just about to ask And also, that. Paul Hunt, he went as well. And, and? My, um, the co-defendant, yeah. he left as well. Everyone left. Everyone left? Everyone left. So I was about to say to you that in history, when people do crimes, they run and hide. But obviously, this is not the case because everybody's shitting it. Yeah, right. and unfortunately, the very next day, oh, 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 Robert oh. Darby passed away. You know, I had just had a thought, right? But, but at the I'd time, time, but at the time, sorry, yeah, it's, yeah. High, it's high for me. At the time, after uh, the co-defendant had clashed and stabbed Rob, Robert Darby in the street, he, in that area, and there'll be people watching this video that will know this, at that time, he was bragging about it that he had got the better of Robert Darby. Hearsay. And come the next day, not here, sir, okay. and come the next day, shut up. Because he, he, but obviously then he wasn't expecting him to die, was he? No. No. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay, I'm not really proven it's, and tested, it's, but it's I get tragic. what you mean. I always think to myself, what damage did Paul Hunt do trying to get but Robert then, in the car? But then obviously now, first in 2012, everybody's away hiding. Yeah. Who comes back first to face the music? Jason. Jason came, with, um, he um, secured an interview to come and, and answer the police's questions. He'd right. had enough by this point, had enough. Okay. The whole family had had enough. And who, in which order, Hunt, the co-defendant, which... So... Because oh, so the co-defendant really gave himself up as well then. And gave him, and just came back on his own free will and came back. You're yeah? joking? No, I'm not joking. Who told you that? Well, that's what I was thinking. If Jason did it, why didn't he? No, no, no. No? No, yummy, no. Well, how did he get back there? Right, so Jason Jason contacted his solicitor back here in the UK. Gotcha. He came um, back to answer uh, the police's inquiries, if you like. Gotcha. There was no arrest warrant or anything out for Jason's arrest, nothing like that. Wow. He literally just came back in. Like I said, the fear was more of the, the family and all the, the rest yeah. of it. I think that makes sense Sends now to out. people. Right. Um, so he come back in. He did a six-hour interview with the police and he went home, basically. Who did? Jason. He went. Gordon, he he really? left the police station and went. There was no charge against him. Yeah, and? So, um, Tim Darby told me. Who is? Uh, Robert Darby's brother, the okay. victim's family, told me. Mm. Because they've been fighting this case now for 10 years. It'll be 10 years in December. This December, it'll be 10 years. So, they've been trying to put right this terrible Rob, wrong step back for minute, 10 years. I just yeah. asked you. Mm. What happened with the code? Yes. I'm staying with. Well, there's the a return. reason I'm saying it, Yami. Right, there's a reason because when Jason went for a committal hearing after the Abdul Ahmed gotcha. ID, Tim Darby was standing outside a committal hearing talking to the police, and the police said to him, "We haven't got anything on more. What we're going to have to do? Oh, no. What we're going to have to do oh, is dear. find the other one and bring him back." And oh. what happened was, gotcha. Yami, oh, no. what happened was, the police 
always knew where he was. And you know how I know that? How do you know that? Because in eight years, the Derby family have sat there suffering. Oh, no. Yeah. At a committal hearing, they say, we'll have to bring the other one back. And yummy. Oh, it was no. weeks. They had him under gunpoint at a telephone box somewhere in Spain and they extradited him back to the UK so, in the April. It so, was the April, yeah. So he had to rub a bit of porridge in Spain before they got him there. Oh, to I extradite don't know him, that. yeah, you would have to. No idea. So he tasted prison a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So he comes But back. they extradited him back on a mortgage fraud because in this case there was a Yeah, but he was wanted for murder. Absolutely. So they never extradited him for the uh, a mortgage fraud. They extradited him because they want to talk to him about a murder. But they didn't want to talk to Jason Moore for about a murder. Is that what That's exactly right, yeah. Is that exactly right? Mm -hmm. Gordon Bennett. Yeah. Where was Hunt? Um, at that time, I actually don't know. I well, don't know where he was. He must have appalled him at some stage. I think he, he's, he's I think he was in the, in the UK. I yeah. think he was back in the UK. So Jason's already been in the police station six hours. Yeah, six hours interview. Yeah. And then what released. happens? The co-defendant comes back under gunpoint. And what happens next? Well, no, if we can just go back just before that he got extradited. Um, well, actually, if that was the... No, I think I think it was... Jason went on a, after he did the six hour interview, it was literally days after that, that Abdul Ahmed was brought back into the police station to do an ID parade. And it was on that ID parade that he picked out Jason. So eight years after his first ID of a police volunteer as the stabber, he's now picking out Jason as the stabber. Eight years later. Eight years later. Right, not free to Abdul Ahmed versus um, everything else. So hold on. How would he remember that eight years and the difference in the pictures that we cho chose from the first man that he picked up that remarkably resembles somebody else? And then he picks out um, Jason eight years later. So I think the question is, who in their right mind would put someone on an ID eight years later? Right, so we've got the inconsistencies there. When it went to trial, did this thing get brought up about the first identification and the second one? Well, the police managed to convince the CPS on this ID to take Jason to the, the trial, to trial. When that ID got into the trial, at the end, that's very important that bit, at the end, because it should have happened at the beginning, yeah. and I don't know the reason for that. At the end, the judge threw that ID out. Really? Said it was no good. Couldn't have that ID after eight years. Right. He threw it out. Threw it out, yeah. At the trial. At the end of the trial. What in his doing, summing up else, to verdict. All right, so what else was there on Jason then? In his summing up to verdict. Because you're saying that they released him without charge. There was no He changed his statement and chose a different person. What else was on Jason Moore? There was nothing. So then if you threw out the ID, because that's the reason why they should had something to charge him with then. Yeah. Why didn't they throw it out then? Exactly. What else? There must have been something else. There was nothing else. You've got to be kidding me. No, I ain't. You're having a laugh. I'm not having a laugh, Jeremy. It's not even funny. Well, it is, because it's the funniest case I've How ever the fuck heard. is it I've funny? Won, How is it funny? I oh, know it's not funny. The police and the CPS put an innocent man up right. on a okay. eight, an ID All after right, eight Kirstie. years. Kirsty, what happened with the co-defendant then? The co-defendant um, comes back. They are jointly charged with first-degree murder. Yeah? Yeah. They're on remand together? Or Bell? No, and that's what. Both on Bell? No. No. Who's on remand? Who's the in custody? Defendant. In custody? Yeah. Jason's on Bell? Yeah. Because he's got no previous convictions, no, no. bad character. Got nothing. Gambler by trade. Got nothing. Never really been to prison his whole life. No. And right at the twilight of his career, with a family to look after, works every day legitimately, ends up spending the rest of his life in prison for something he doesn't do. Why didn't they have an alternative charge of manslaughter, even though he didn't do that? I have no idea. Because if Darby's turning up looking to kill everybody, mm -hmm. I mean, the co-defendant had to spin around, so he obviously wasn't looking to do him anything that day. It wasn't in his mind. No. So how would it be then? Why was the co-defendant in custody and Jason on bail? I think one of the... Because the, the, we've got previous... I think we've got to also remember mm. that um, one of the... F the things about this case is it involved two different police forces. Oh, so you had God. the initial police force in and 2005 then and then you got this lot in 2012. 
So the great. I mean, funny enough, when this trial was over, I just want to just want to say this. When this trial was over, Jason's partner, the police had to give her some paperwork back, and one of the lead do, two detectives was a woman called um, was a woman, and uh, the woman said to her, where she mentioned herself and another officer, oh. and she said, myself and so and so just want you to know that it was nothing personal. Oh no. And there's more than one way to skin a cat. What they were saying is he got railroaded. The co-defendant got not killed. Yes. But hold on, one, let's get this right. At the trial, the police and the prosecution decided to let the witnesses let Jason Moore and his co-defendant behind the screens so no one can have a look at them. Is yes, that right? That's exactly right. So but what, And that happened with all witnesses. With all witnesses. Yeah. So then how could that when it's five foot ten, both of them, but wouldn't it have been fair to say, or am I jumping the gun here, that if they had a chance to look at Jason Moore in the dark, with everything that's been said at a trial, because he's six foot five, they wouldn't have found him guilty because he doesn't fit the description. One hundred. So you take the description out of it, you take the um, the great Abdul Ahmed, who we're beginning to understand might yeah. not have even been, been there that day. Yeah. They've been calling him the invisible man out there. Apparently he's met a journalist and he and said, Yes. Said, yeah, I'm sorry. I just said what I said. I was drunk on that morning at 10.15 in the morning. Yeah. So hold on. If they knew that bit, why didn't the appeal court say, well, if he was admitting that he was drunk and he, was, he might not have been this way and he looked like this and looked like that, how come the appeal, how, how does that all work out then? Well, with, with regard to Abdul Ahmed, I mean, if I, oh. we just talk about him for a minute, yeah, you're talking on. about, he wasn't offered an interpreter. He no. was from Somalia. Yeah. His English was very bad. We know mm. that because of other statements. Mm. If we talk about the actual day in question. Yeah. So, yes, we do know that he was drunk now from a journalist, oh, but God. that comes later. But let's let's look at what happened mm. on the actual day. He gets on a train. He goes to the wrong station. He finds it on the central line. He went the wrong way. He finds his right way. He comes out of Gantz Hill Station. They say, what time is it on the clock? He goes, it's 12 o'clock right he walks past the very place he was going to a a, a loan company or yeah, a place yeah. called welcome finance he walks straight past it yeah. which is how he ended up in perth road in the first place gets to the end of the road can't make out where he is yeah turns round, head down hat on and then he claims to have seen an incident but he also claims that he saw it over his shoulder yeah but the next minute he's saying no he was level with the cars then he's saying no, it was over the other side of the road. Then he comes back. The police decided they couldn't get a grip on where he was. Even in the witness interviews, they were asking him questions like, what side of the car is the passenger seat? And he goes, no, sorry, what side of the car is the driver's seat? And he goes, is it left, is it? And he goes, they go, will you be able to identify anyone again? No. Were you ever in any doubt of who did the stabbing? Yes. Mr. Ahmed, we don't want you to guess. So this, then they go and visit him twice. One and day say before to him, the trial started. Hold on. To change. Hold on a minute. What about then, that bit? Hold on a minute. All right, all right. Then they go and see him twice yeah. and say, did you draw these diagrams? They go, well, no, please help me. Oh, no. Then two officers go around his house the night before the trial. I heard this. After eight years. He, they claim he makes an unsolicited comment that his statement doesn't say the passenger of the silver car was the stabber. So in all that contact with the police after eight years, all of a sudden, the night before the trial, he claims that. It's just changed completely. Well, obviously you've been coerced. But oh, obviously. It's obviously. But everybody's been coerced. One of the key oh, points the with... Scene, right? Go on. One of the key points yeah. of Abdul Ahmed is the police could not get a grip on what this man's evidence was. They even did a, recon only... they even did a reconstruction and they had to stop it. Yeah, but hold on, Kirsty. That to wasn't disclosed, it. by the way. Yeah, but if all this, what you're saying about the only witness, apart from Paul Hunter, was asleep, of course, the only witness that is alleged to have seen everything, because we didn't say it right, there's no forensic mm. on Jason Moore. Um, the trial was bodged up, his solicitors were a load of shit. And remember, he's not really experienced in criminal trials, is he, Jason Moore? No. Because he doesn't know how it works. It wouldn't be like no. me going in there, because... Who went into the box to give evidence first? Him or his co-defendant? Jason. Jason went in there first? Yeah. Oh dear. So, I'm not, you know, I'm not setting the cat amongst the pigeons here, but if Jason went in, I heard they kicked off with each other in the dock. Well, the co-defendant, I mean, it was an absolute, 
I don't even know how to describe that one, Yami. You had to you had to witness it to believe it. You're talking about uh, I don't know what 17 stone muscle man, ex rugby player enforcer, mm. turns up in the dock in a suit, mm. like three sizes too big for him. Little man glasses. When he was talking about his family, he was snivelling and asking for tissues. Then he gave evidence, and as he came back, Jason said to him, "What the fuck was that?" And he went, "Judge, judge, he's threatening me." Yeah, bit of acting. So the judge ended up putting a guard in between them. So it was Making all this Jason kind of look not the aggressor. They haven't well rolled in him, have they? Because yes. he's a big wet the old years of Charles. No, he I'm not listen, anyone that I'm looks at this for five argue, minutes. But hold on a minute. Jason was arguing with the judge every morning, saying, look, they're doing this to me. Because no, what no, looks no, like no. happening, let Jason no. give evidence first so that then yeah. they can give theirs after. But what was happening, Yummy? Yeah. Oh dear, in the I'm trial, not saying every anything. morning in the trial, mm. The co-defendant's defence were over there having a good old chat with the police every day. It became so apparent that Jason wrote a note to his um, solicitor. So that open. can't be right. Every morning, they're having big discussions. Well, that can't be right. Is that allowed? Is it? You, is it allowed? Well, that, he didn't. He's, you're talking about the kind of thing that's an enforcer and a judge, but he's got no convictions for that. But he's got convictions for... Oh, oh no, he, he had a mortgage fraud when he came back. Well, the, more, well, the mortgage one. fraud was discovered in a suitcase within... Did this. they bring up his previous in the court? Um, no, I don't, no they, they brought up one one thing that said that he had road rage. Yeah. Um, yeah but the the mortgage fraud got mentioned, but never got explained. Yeah, but it was a massive money thing, so it, he, he must have gone to prison was, for it. He was branded, if you go online, you can read it yourself. Oh, he it? was branded as one of the two ringleaders in right, this so multi-million pound, pound mortgage fraud. Oh, so he got found get you went even down his, for it. He even got, his, he's his, years. even he got three or four for Even his missus was involved in it. Right, yeah. all right, all right. No, oh, they, no, they were, no, no so. hold on a minute. Oh. Hold on. Oh. All them people, we're talking 13 people here, Yami. All of them got f got found guilty. All of them. Oh, he so got he, found guilty got in his four absence. Or five. They all got three scores for that. Because I've ever been reading Well, what did he get then? Well, he must have got four. Three, four. Got a pound fine, Yami. As the ringleader. Oh, like, yeah, that is hearsay. No, you make of it what you want. Yeah, I but know he got what a pound, you got a pound fine, and everybody else got bird, all right. It can happen that way sometimes, uh, if you know what you're doing. Oh, he's good at getting out of things. But listen, look, at the end of the day, he still got found not guilty. So they've changed positions. Jason Moore ends up in custody. The co-defendant walks. Yeah. Oh, sorry, so it's not really funny, but it's almost laughable. I would have won this case. I would have done. I would have represented myself on this case. On one. The reality but, is, the, no, the reality of it is, Rami, is if if Robert Darby's injured, the co-defendant's knocked out with a knife, and the other fellow's asleep. Yeah. It only left one person. Right, they... right, now listen, Kirsty. When you walked out of the courtroom after he got sentenced, after you he said got... you bumped into someone outside the court, who was it? It was when the verdict came back. When the verdict came back? Yeah, um, when Jason got found guilty of murder and the other guy got not guilty, I came out of the Old Bailey and there was a pub across the road. Right. So obviously, I couldn't take it in, Yummy. I was all over the place. I, my, I had to call my parents. My parents were literally waiting for me you was, to call them. You must them. have been shitting yourself from the victim's families because you're thinking that well, they're thinking that even though he said what he said, that you're, you're, they were yet to go through that every day. Well, I sat, to come up. Yeah, I sat I sat next next to some of them for yeah, weeks yeah. and weeks, and I I sat looking over some of the some of the Derby family were down there yeah. in the courtroom itself, but a lot of them were up here yeah. in the viewing gallery, as okay. you know. Yeah. So there was always this. You know, so, so because of emigrating and the fear and all the rest of it. Anyway, yeah, of course. There was two. He had two main older brothers. One was called Mick, and the other one was called Tim. And they yeah. were the two that were predominantly down in the courtroom the whole time. Sorry. And when I walked across the road, there's a pub on the corner opposite a church called the Viaduct, and I was standing there and I was trying to pluck up the courage to call me dad, and tell him what had happened. Oh. And who the who the fuck wants to tell their parents that that's right. just happened? Yeah. And as I'm standing there, a car pulls up right in front of me and I saw this bald geezer get out of it and it was that Tim Darby, it mm -hmm. was the brother. So you're flapping. So I'm thinking, oh. and I didn't know, I, I was froze really. Mm -hmm. And he walked mm -hmm. up to me and he went, you Kirsty? 
I went, yeah, he's gone. I know your brother ain't done that. And I went, and do you know what my response was? What is it? Well, why the fuck didn't you tell them in there? Well, for the and first... he went, I know, I know your brother hasn't done that. Take my number, give me your number, and we'll talk later. That's the first time in history that I've ever bumped into a case where the victim's family are yeah. saying the one convicted of it, it isn't them. Because yeah. I heard he went to the police station. Yeah, and the, look, can I just say, they ain't just saying it weeks later. They said it on the fucking day. What happened when you went to the police station? Right, to, so... To, to join in to so help obviously, uh, an innocent man, a miscarriage of justice. Yeah, obviously he wasn't happy with what he heard in the in the court. Oh, God. Um, he thought that the guy coming there asleep, he thought that was a load of bullshit, like everybody else did. And it was a load of bullshit. Who's, 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 who falls asleep for 30 seconds? So... You know, there was all that. And like he says, he says that his his brother was so erratic a driver, you wouldn't stand a chance of going to sleep. And the commotion and outside the door, because it's right outside the door where he's claiming to be asleep. Mm. He ain't down the road. So um, he weren't happy with that. No. So uh, he went and saw Paul Hunt himself. And he said to, uh, he said to me that when he spoke to him, um, he, this fella Paul Hunt, he said, listen, out of respect for your brother, I'll tell you what happened. He said, but I've purged myself in that court oh, and no. I ain't going to repeat this conversation. And basically what he said to him was that the other fella, the Cody, was the one that clashed with him in the road and that Moore never got out of the car. Don't make me laugh. So what happened was um, Tim Darby took that information oh, to the police. Yeah, took that information to the police. Well, it's a fucking liberty, Yami. Someone's just been oh. lifed off. So he took that, oh. that information to the police, oh. right? Um, and the woman that I was telling you about before, one of the lead, two lead detectives, the she was there that, yeah. with some other copper. Anyway, he said to her, you've got the wrong man in there. You know you've got the wrong man. And she's going, no, 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 we've got a man. He's gone, no, you've just got a fucking body, love. Yeah? The real killer of my brother's still out there. Yeah. This is the information I've got for you. And she said, no, it's over. Go home. He became irate. She turned around and said, if you don't go home, I'll have to arrest you. So he left. Four o'clock the next morning, CID from Dagnan Police Station turned up on his front door. Yeah. And they said, listen, we can't, we know you're upset about the case. We mm. can't talk about the case, but we've got to give you a reverse Osman warning. Which you means, know, you, do you which know what means, that is? We'll explain to the viewers. Which basically means stay the fuck out of it. So that information he's now got the police won't accept it. No. What does he do next? You tell me. He goes and sees his solicitor. And? Tells the solicitor what's happened. And the solicitor's told him to get in touch with Jason's solicitor. Right. And to go in there and make a statement. That's exactly what he did. Not only did he do that, yeah, he then said, I'll come to the Court of Appeal. And that's what he did. The victim's family came to the Court of Appeal with that information to tell the court that Jason hasn't done it, and this is the information he's got, and he came to that Court of Appeal. Wasn't there someone else as well that went to this Yes, Paul Who's Hunt's that? girlfriend at the time. Now, bear in mind, at the time, he was scared. Everybody in this case is scared, right. yeah? And that is a fact. Everybody in this case is scared. Got all these rumours going around and all the rest of it. She finds, she splits up with Paul Hunt, oh, yeah? Too. But later on, she finds out that Jason's been convicted of the murder. Mm. Well, she can't have that because she knows otherwise. And the reason she does is because when Paul, come, Paul Hunt came home from the police yeah, station, yeah. he told her everything. And he said to her, don't tell the police because it will cause us problems. So she's come in to Jason's solicitor and, she? and she's made a statement. And she didn't want to come to court, but she felt that she morally had to. And she came to court. now. Both of them people had nothing to gain by coming to the Port of, Court of Appeal. Both of them people didn't know each other. They both give literally the same evidence on Paul Hunt. And both of them were discredited because of Paul Hunt. Because Paul Hunt had destroyed the, the trial. He destroyed that trial. Yeah. And now at the Court of Appeal, yeah, we've got the very barrister that put Paul Hunt in front of a jury saying he's not credible. Huh. And the court are saying 
even if he knew he was never going to say it anyway. So right there, that alone Simply should enough. have got Jason, at, at worst, a retrial. He got to get thrown out, surely. Because exactly. that Duwami, he's, he's, he's another one. Exactly. He's been proven. They said, but yeah, instead of doing that, no. instead of doing that, they they basically, well, they basically, the two people, two key people that came there to, to, to show them what right. Paul Hunt had done okay. and how he'd purged himself in the court and destroyed the trial, they got rid of him. Gordon Bennett. It's unbelievable. And that's, it's a mockery of the justice system. An absolute mockery of the justice system. How long has he been away now? This will be in, in December. It'll be 10 years. And he can't get out and he can't do the courses because he's not admitting to the crime. No. He was, didn't even get out of the car. No. And there's um, one key piece of evidence that um, we haven't discussed. And I think it's really important is the pathology in this case. Yeah. Because the investigation by the police is so, I mean, when you read it, you cannot believe what you're reading. No. Abdul Ahmed said the passenger of the silver car was the man that stabbed Robert Darby. First statement. The Court of Appeal held the conviction because they said that that there was held by the pathology evidence. Which turns out... They said, because of all these inconsistencies, yeah, they got rid of all these inconsistencies and they came down to one thing. That, every, one, that they agree. Abdul Ahmed saw the passenger stab Robert Darby and because the pathology said it was one stab that that was a safe conviction but the reality is not that the reality is this the pathology says that the knife that Abdul Ahmed said stabbed did not stab Robert Darby and the reason it didn't stab Robert Darby is because if the knife that Ahmed described had stab it, stabbed him, it would have gone straight through him. It was three times bigger than the knife that stabbed Robert Darby. And what's more, the pathologist, the, sorry, the guy that did the post-mortem in 2005 has been removed from the Home Office Register. Because? He's a bent pathologist. <laughs> Because there was other cases where people had been oh. charged with murder and so on because of his shoddy work. And it gets worse. And the and in the trial, in the trial, the Crown Prosecution knew that this man had been struck off, yet they still put him in front of a jury. Right. So as for the Court of Appeal, the information I just told you there, we didn't, we didn't know that. So we're going back to the CCRC with mm. it. So, Abdul Ahmed, when we first went to the CCRC, we kept saying, in the Court of Appeal, we kept saying, go and listen to this man's evidence. It's impossible. He's so inconsistent. None of what he's saying makes sense. We go to the CCRC. We don't change our stance. We go to the CCRC. We're saying, what are you... listen, this man's got it wrong. He's got it wrong. The CCRC choose not to investigate i'm out here fighting for jason doing everything i can me and a journalist yeah from newsquest we are working two years yeah i mean two years we're working we come to the end of it to do an audible uh, podcast series of eight episodes we come to the end of it and he goes to me now i've got to get the rights of reply in because of the legal stuff right he calls up abdul ahmed and he says to him <laughs> Abdul Ahmed, did you know that you picked out two different men? One in 2005, one in yes. 2000. And he goes, no, did I? He goes, what do you want from me? It was a blink of an eye. I was passing by. And I was drunk. So he goes, what? That's, that's first he goes, I was drunk. unreliable, so he so, would have to go out the window. So the journalist says, did you tell the police? He goes, yeah, I told the police. Oh, no. Something Jason's defence has never had. Didn't know anything about it. But I remember when I was told about it, you know, when a light bulb goes off, everything now makes sense. The guy was drunk. But more than that, Yemi, it's 10.30 on a Wednesday morning and he's right. drunk. 
Wait, so alcohol dependency? Yeah, but Night you before? Get a, you wouldn't even get to Crown Court if you're a witness and you say that, because then you're totally unreliable. So then you would be taking out the equation, which means that there so would be a trial. If the police... Because the whole trial and pathology thing relies on Abdul Hamid yeah. as being correct. So I can't see yeah, how I mean, it's taking this on. We can only say that if the police had told the CPS on that charging decision initially yeah. that this man had been intoxicated while he made that ID, do you really think I'll just explain that, that would have been taken to trial? Who is campaigning for this tragic miscarriage of justice? Jason Moore, give me some names that are campaigning so we can show um, what kind of figures are involved in it. Right, so we're really fortunate. We're really fortunate and we've got... We've got Lord Ian Botham, so he's the cricket guy the that we all love all and adore. Of all all yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember got... when he won the test at Headley against the Aussies way back in the day. Yeah. The greatest, yeah, reliable. Yeah. Who else? We've got Lord Nicholas Monson. Mm, all right. We've got Lady Samantha Cole. Oh, I like her. You like her? Yeah. Um, for me. We've got Bobby Cummings OBE. I think we all know who Bobby is. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest, yeah. We've got Linda Calvey. Oh, the greatest. The greatest yeah. Black Widow. Oh, yeah, I like her. She's brilliant. She's coming on my show soon. Um, and many others, yummy. Many, many others. And now you've got me. Oh, we've got, Let's we've not got forget you. to make Matt Legg as well. Oh, we've got, well, we've got, listen, we've got Terry Ellis, it's Matt Legg. Terry Ellis, that's what I was going to say. We've got Yummy B, all you little podcasters. Sean Atwood, Sean Atwood supports. Jason English supports the camera. Is it Jason English? Yeah. Jason um, English, yeah. Lots of characters and, and, uh, yeah. And the petition. We've got to get that signed. Yeah, the petition like. is really... If you lot don't get on this bit, yeah, it's really unbelievable, really. I mean, I don't ask much from you all, and all the signatures in the world, it's on the community page. If you could do that I think with me. the petition, what people have got to remember, it's not necessarily... Listen, you don't have to make Jason right or wrong. You don't have to make... Your no, opinion is, no. is, you know, obviously I want your opinion. Yeah. I think with the petition, the petition is a way that we get to have a fucking voice, you know what I mean? You've got loads behind it. If we can get a voice in the House of Parliament, yeah, don't just help us. Because in everybody. the end, he's going to win it. It, does, it helps don't just everybody. hang on to. We yeah. saw with Malkinson the other day. I'm going to do a piece on that. I mean, and understand, like, when evidence is presented, even yeah. a couple of years after oh. someone being away, why does it take another 15 years to get him out when everybody knows, like, in this case, that he's innocent? Which is it's going to happen. But why should he have to rot in there? Um, to be honest, so you do your best here to help Kirsty. She does my nutting every day, and she does everyone's <laughs> nutting. She doesn't live a normal life. She's no, suicidal. She gets worried. Her brother's got to live in those conditions where he's got to look at the ceiling every day. He's got to be saying so. He's got no one else. I know what that feels like. He's not going to get out because he's not done it. So he's not going to admit to his offences. The only person in her daily life for the last ten stretch. Uh, it's I driving it, everyone mad because she's to, got to, to get her brother out yeah. because she knows that he didn't do it. Yeah. So I would ask you all. Um, it's not kind of, just that, Yummy. Mm. Yeah, I don't get suicidal. Let's you put that on the well, table. You told me something. Well, you well, told me in the car this morning is, that sometimes is, you feel like dying. That's yeah, what well, you no, said. Sometimes you feel like dying yeah. just to get taken oh, okay. out of it, out of this mess. Yeah, but if you did, then he would have no help. What I'm saying mm. is, mm. listen, there's plenty more fight in me. I'll go all the way. Well, you didn't sound like that in the car this morning, so I stopped giving it the bigger. No, it's not even. No, Yummy. Let's make it straight. Let's make it straight. I've never How would you feel if you'd done nine years of looking at case profiles? How is it? How is it that in fighting a miscarriage of justice, oh, you no. have to fight every bit of it? Every know. little bit of it is a fight. CCRC are a fight. It's CPS, fight. no disclosure. Talking about no disclosure, see Paul Hunt. The police and the CPS haven't oh, given okay. us any disclosure around that. None. I don't even know what he said in his witness interview. Yummy. His toxicology, blood. Don't even know if he was on drugs because they won't let us know. The blue jacket. The blue jacket won't give us the blue jacket so we can test it. Yeah. The list is endless. Yeah, it's endless. So how the fuck are you supposed to fight a miscarriage of justice when they won't give you the tools to do it? What about that one? And the thing about it, he, when he does eventually, when he gets out, if they, they, they're going to do the right thing, it will say how long we'll worry about Look at that Malkinson, they buried Nothing can't the happen to anything. Exactly. Nothing can't, happen to, nothing can't the happen to anyone else now because if um, once Jason gets released, nobody else can't get charged anyway, can they? Because Abdul um, Ahmed isn't going to be able to be a reliable witness. So basically, they just got a body out of nowhere and just made it stick there. So it's not like anyone could get prosecuted later on down the line because all the things that was ever there, everything's been proven to pathologists, Abdul Ahmed. So it's not like anyone sticking it on anyone you else you can't do anything question. how would you feel I know if you it. were sitting in prison mm. innocent mm. Yeah? yeah and you knew that there was disclosure that mm. could make you a free man and poor old Jason has never been to prison before spent his last days 40s 50s and going into there um, you know I put it on my community page some of you that have seen it and you know, it's very hot disheartening so it's very, it's very, very tearful um, and he also writes about how how he feels 
in those conditions. In um, he was even in. I imagine he went to the Category A's um, for this murder from Belmarsh. They shipped him straight out because of his size, with no previous history in prison. Normally, I'm not saying nothing. Gun crime, you can go straight to the Cat A's. But normally these days, with the kind of tariff that Jason's got, you'd actually go to Swellside first or a B Cat. They've went actually sent him into. Went to Full Sutton. Yeah, been to Full Sutton straight away, as McVicker told you the other day. He's a great chess player and blah, 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 blah. But why to the Cat A's? He's been under pressure and nobody listening and coming out crying every day and people not believing what he's saying. They all heard that one before. And all that, but you got killed. But you know, you could scream to the top of the roofs. No one in there, they don't really care. And that's the God's honest truth. But there's his voice out here. She's making inroads so, at the moment. The campaign's <laughs> gathering momentum. And um, thanks to everybody. I really do appreciate okay. it. Right, we'll go through. This is what he actually feels like from staring at that ceiling day and night for a crime that he never committed. It's called Rise of a Broken Man. You go first. You have taken my life, it wasn't yours to take. You have broken my heart, it wasn't yours to break. You stole yeah. my spirit, it wasn't yours to steal. Now I am tortured, soul that may never ever heal. In prison now, a broken man left to die. I stare at the ceiling as the days pass me by. Life in tatters, dreams destroyed. I stare at the heavens, very annoyed. I'm in darkness now, going through hell life passing me by as I rot in this cell. In this living hell where I didn't do anything wrong. I must find a way to just keep strong. I stare at the sky and shout, why me? I was once so happy and above all free. But something within the depths of me has awoken. It's pleading with me, don't stay broken. It's pleading with me, stay alive any way you can. It pleads with me, stand as a man. So I will now wipe away the tears of anger. The tears of despair. The tears that say life isn't fair. And as a once broken man in prison, surrounded by sin. My new attitude is never give in. I will win my heart and find my soul. I will get my spirit back and become whole. Now my spirit says, hold on. Now my heart, it beats strong. I found my soul and to my surprise, a once broken man has begun to rise. Once starved of inspiration and looking at defeat. This new broken man doesn't know when he is beat. I will stare down the demons. I will find the light. When I come across evil, I will put up a fight. And when I'm finally, finally free from this prison. The world will know a broken man has risen. Well, big words for a man like that, really. I'm not really falling for that one there. He's very broken. Um, obviously, he's got to stand to be tall in that, in, that, in those surroundings. Otherwise, you're just going to lie down and die. There's many men that commit suicide for things like this. There's many men that are going to you know, take drugs and do things like that. There's many men that will never, ever be able to recover from being in jail when you haven't done anything. The mental torture to lie there day in and day out, your mental health, you could even end up in a nutter if you're not strong enough. Jason's just one of those characters that just, you know, half-wittingly, half-heartedly just says, I'll, I'll keep fighting because he's got that kind of character. He was happy-go-lucky. He's not a prison man. He don't know how the criminal system works. He didn't know. You know, at the end of the day, Curse has been very brave of you. I hope you've got everything in. I ask you all, please, do me one favour, um, and I'll tell you a Cat A story, a proper one, if you sign the petition and, yeah. you know, do what's honourably right because we know deep down that Jason Moore hasn't done this, all right? So big Thanks love to you for much, coming. Thanks very much, Thank it's you. Thank Don't you. Don't worry about it, Wayne. You're all right? Um, but good day to you. Uh, more interviews coming up. But this one is a real, real deep one. All right. Thank you all. Love you all, dearly.